Well, I guess I guess we could start. Two minutes over, that seems to be appropriate in German. So, good morning. Welcome to my talk show, you name it. Um, today I'm talking about TCP SIM slots. Um, I'm Henning, in case somebody has not figured that out yet. I'm uh, an OpenBSD developer for actually 15 years this year, which sounds kind of weird to me. And yeah, so. TCP SYNFLATS. Um, SYNFLATS kind of attack the early stage, so we got to look at the uh, connection setup for one second again. In this talk, whenever I say client or server, this means TCP client or server, not the classical set. So a mail server sending an email to another server is a client. Connection setup, the client sends a SYN packet <coughs> with his initial sequence number. The TCP server if he takes the connection, that is, replies with a syn ack. He is acking our sequence number, plus one, and he's sending his initial sequence number. The client then acts that syn ack, once again, acking the sequence number the server sent and in incrementing his sequence number by one. That is important insofar that these replies require knowledge of the previous packet because they quote the sequence number plus one. The initial sin is actually quite important. The initial sequence number, we need to track it to be able to verify that subsequent packets actually belong to this connection and that they arrive in the right order. The initial sequence number should not be guessable. If an attacker, a blind attacker that cannot see the traffic, can guess the sequence number and the port numbers, he'll be able to spoof packets onto our existing connection, which is something we absolutely don't want, obviously. The most prominent example of uh, problems with the sequence number guessability, um, I guess it's the most prominent one, is the BGP RSD attack from 2004. Basically, somebody figured out that most operating systems, including those running on those big iron routers, did not require the RST to be on a specific edge of the window. They required the RST to be somewhere in the window. And the VGP routers at that time used to use pretty big TCP windows. And so you could send a relatively low number of packets with sequence numbers spaced far enough apart. And one of them would hit the window. The BGP session would be reset. And the BGP TCP session reset means that the routers remove the routes. So they go offline, or at least lose one uplink peering session. So the non-guessability of the initial sequence number is actually pretty, pretty critical. The initial SYN also contains the maximum segment size. That is basically the MTU of the host minus the TCP and IP headers. This is not necessarily the, the usable MTU because the path might have a smaller in between, but still we need that because we certainly cannot send segments bigger than that. The MSS is only in the initial SYN. It is not repeated anywhere else, so we've got to remember this for the rest of the connection. The initial SYN also contains a bit indicating whether the, uh, the host supports selective acknowledgments. In regular TCP, you receive a packet and you basically act it, and then you get the next packet. This, well, this is Windows scale, I come to that. Um, if you lose a packet, the, the side that notices that there's a packet missing can only indicate the last one it received and all subsequent packets have to be resent. With selective acknowledgments, the missing one can be resent individually. And it contains the window scaling information. And that is also only in the SYN. Window scaling, that's the TCP window. That is basically the maximum number of unacknowledgement segments in flight. If you acknowledgement every segment individually, the round trip time kills your performance. So you send a bunch of packets and acknowledge them at once. And how big that bunch is, that is the TCP window. The larger TCP windows help a lot with the high bandwidth delay product. And with the link speeds we have today, this basically affects everybody. The TCP window is not only required by the stacks, 
that talk to each other, if there is a stateful firewall in between, and the stateful firewall actually makes sure that the TCP segments belong to the TCP connection they pretend to belong to, not all that many firewalls actually do that, but PF happens to do, needs that window scaling information, obviously, because otherwise they don't know how big the window is. Which one? That one? Whenever you walk me, we get static. So are you telling me I should stop walking? That doesn't work. From your pockets to your belt, don't move less. To my belly? No. <laughs> I don't have a belt. Better? Okay. Your recording is okay because that's in the pocket too? Okay. Where did I leave off now? I left off with the stateful firewall needs that information as well. So, um, <laughs> quick recap on how the BSD TCP stack works. A TCP server that receives that SYN stores things as in parameters and stuff it learned from that SYN in so-called protocol control blocks or short PCBs. Those PCBs are allocated up on reception of the first SYN, classically, today it's slightly different, I'll get to that, um, is allocated up on reception of that SYN and inserted into a hash table. And there, of course, is a certain cost to it and there is a memory footprint for the, for the PCB, even though it's relatively small. And then it replies with the SYN ACK. On the client side, the PCB is allocated before even sending the SYN out. When it receives the SYN egg from the TCP server, it finds the PCB, updates it, and uh, replies with the egg, and then our TCP session is fully established. That first egg from the client seldom does, but can contain payload. That's an important bit here. The client the server or any intermediate router or firewall or whatever is in the path can drop packets, even a cable could in theory if it's cut, <laughs> uh, and you're possibly getting a TCP RST back, you could also get an ISMP error message back or you get nothing, you don't know. TCP SYN floods are basically with us ever since we have TCP, TCP so that's for a very, very, very long time. In a SYN flood, the attacker only sends the initial SYN and never ever follows up. That means he does not need to see the SYN act. And that in turn means that he doesn't have to use his own IP address as source. He can spoof it because he's not <coughs> interested in the replies. And in a SYN flood attack, as the name kind of indicates, he doesn't send one but a lot. Now, that affects TCP servers and has for a long time and there are mitigations for that, but it also affects stateful firewalls, and they have not quite caught up with that problem yet. And I'll get to why we got away with that. Since the TCP server has to allocate the PCB and update the hash table for every SYNAC it receives, um, there's resource allocation. The firewall a stateful firewall allocates a state table entry and inserts that to its data structure. PF, it's a red black tree. So that is resource allocation and computational cost. And that is familiar for anything that tracks flows, quite obviously, because it has to track them somehow. Eventually, you hit limits. So eventually, this becomes a denial of service. The mean bit about SYN floods is that the attack is so cheap to carry out. The attacker does not have to keep track of anything. He can spoof everything. He doesn't even see the replies, so they are not clogging his pipe. Um, the SYNs from a SYN flood attack are pretty hard to distinguish from legitimate traffic, at least if the attack is carried out well, which in practice fortunately doesn't happen all that often. But that means that very, very few resources are enough to carry out a out of service attack, even against big servers and firewalls. And that in turn means that even a small guy can cause big problems. Michael still here? <laughs> too close to home, 
Let's talk about countermeasures, Gwyn. <laughs> Nicely asking the attackers to not attack you, well, that doesn't work. So there are a couple of countermeasures that have been applied to, to stacks and other, well, there's one PF bit in here, um, over time. One is syncache, one is syn cookies. There's syn proxy and PF, which is a little bit different from the others. Except for the PF syn proxy, these countermeasures are implemented in stacks, but not in stateful firewalls. Syn cache is a tiny little cache just for half open TCP connections. That is those that only saw the syn. The idea basically is that you use a data structure that is much smaller than the full PCB to just draw the few bits that you have to remember from the syn store them in a little separate hash table or whatever data structure you'd like to use or tree structure you'd like to use. So that's very lightweight, that uses very little memory, that makes the attack much harder. And memory here in the days of the machine has several gigabyte anyway. Um, it's not just the memory consumption. It also means, it means caches and memory bandwidth, especially the latter is very relevant. The PCB is only allocated when we receive the first egg and the the connection becomes fully established. And since that requires so much fewer resources, the attack becomes much harder. But it's important, SynCache does not actually solve the problem. It just mitigates it very well, because it makes it so much harder to carry it out. Having split off the half-open connections from the fully established connections, however, means that we can have a separate limit for them which helps a lot because then in a SYN flood, established connections won't be affected. However, it still affects legitimate new connections. They might just get dropped in the mess of all those SYNs coming in. SYN cache is implemented in, in the FreeBSD, the OpenBSD, and the NetBSD stacks for a long time. Memory serves roughly 12, 13 years. SYN cookies follow another idea. It would be really, really nice if we did not have to allocate anything when we receive that SYN. However, we still kind of need those little bits of information. And foremost, we need the MSS. So how about encoding the MSS into the initial sequence number? The TCP client has to echo our ISN back plus one. So we could extract that information from there. And that's exactly how SYN cookies work. Typically, the rest of the initial sequence number is a hash over addresses and ports and a secret. With SYN cookies, when we receive the first stack, we can recalculate the ISN that we used with a little bit of information from that packet, the secret we know, and the addresses and ports are in every packet anyway. We have to verify that this egg is really in response to our SYN egg. So the Sequence number at X must match our ISN plus one. Syn cookie implementations, especially the early ones, typically had pretty bad initial sequence numbers. And that means that you are trading TCP stream protection for TCP service protection. However, TCP streams can live for a very long time, days, weeks, years. Yes, I know the Linux people have not understood this, as you can see on every airport, train station, hotel. They keep dropping idle TCP sessions. But they can live for a very long time without LinuxNet, at least. And th since they can live for such a long time, there is no way to fix up a bad initial sequence number. So once you've chosen that, you're stuck with it. In the BSDs, syn cookies so far are only implemented in FreeBSD. PF syn proxy is different. With PF syn proxy, PF handles the entire three-way handshake on, be on behalf of the backend host. And only if the three-way handshake is completed, it does the three-way handshake with the backend host and then basically splices them together. That does protect the destination host, but it does not actually protect the PF host itself from the state table exhaustion attack because we still create state on the initial SYN. So PF under SYN flood, the generic state table exhaustion countermeasures we have, like adaptive timeouts and stuff like that, they have largely been good enough. 
But lately, we've seen attacks that got much worse. And then they have not been good enough anymore. And well, we are hackers. We can do better. And if we can do better, we want to, right? So we should. An idea we were talking about for, for a very long time, for at least a decade, um, was what we called embryonic states. That is basically the Syncash approach. Use a special, a special structure that only carries that little bits, have them in a separate tree, and only upgrade them to the full state upon reception of the first act from the client. However, same problem as Syncash. It doesn't quite solve the problem. It mitigates it very well, but it doesn't quite solve it completely. And well, we like to solve problems completely. So how about Syn cookies? They do solve that problem, but bad initial sequence numbers are a problem, and we don't want that. Turns out, Syn cookie implementations got better. And the one I found in FreeBSD was actually very, very sane. Written by Andre Oppermann, um, he manages to pack the maximum segment size, the window scaling information, and the selective acknowledgement bit, and another bit indicating which of two secrets was used into the ISN, into the sequence number. Now, the sequence number is only 32 bits. MSS and window scaling information alone is 16 bits each, so that doesn't quite fit. And there's a really, really nice trick there. There's a table of the most common MSS and window scaling uh, information values seen in the wild. And instead of encoding the actual value, we're encoding the index into the table. If the value we see is not actually in the table, we just use the next smaller value. That doesn't really hurt. Like the MSS we use might be a few bytes smaller, big deal. The window we use might be a little bit smaller, big deal. So there might be a tiny performance loss. In practice, it's not even noticeable. The analysis carried out says that the table covers 99.5% of all MSS values in the wild. And for the window scaling information table, it's 95%. So that's pretty damn good. SAC and odd even secret are just one bit each, so that adds up to eight bits. Leaves us 24 bits, which we use for the Mac, which is a hash over the source and destination address and port, the ISN from the peer, and a 16-byte secret. We have two secrets. We call it an odd and an even one. They are flipped every 15 seconds. The one becoming active then is replaced by a fresh one, which in turn means the secret's lifetime is 30 seconds, which also means um, the time limit for the three-way handshake is 30 seconds if this is active. So I took the FreeBSD version, which was not standalone. Untangled, KNF, removed excessive comments, stuff like that. I had to rewrite all the glue because, well, PF and the stack, surprise, have slightly different needs. I did replace the hash function that was there with the hash and the questionable way of generating secrets with the very generic up for random buff you use all the time. And I rewrote the key rotation, which was also done in a slightly weird way just using the time timeout API. When we, when we disable Syn cookie, we delete the keys and delete the timeout. So when they are not active, there's zero cost. With that scheme, the initial sequence numbers we choose are still worse than the ones our stack chooses. There's no way around that, because we only have those 32 bits. And if we can use them in a completely random fashion, we are getting better ISNs than if we have to encode something, right? But they're reasonably good and much better than some cookie ISNs used to be. But that still means we don't want to use some cookies all the time. We basically only want to use them when we have to. And that, in turn, means that PF needs a way to detect that we are under SYN flood. When we are under SYN flood, the slightly worse initial sequence numbers are your smaller problem. 
because without countermeasures, we basically go offline. So how do we detect the SYN flood? First, that means we need full accounting of half open TCP connections. Now, we could just mark the state table and count, but, well, that would not solve the problem at all because you're wasting so much performance on walking the table that the attack becomes even more effective. So we need to track each and every little TCP state change and increase or decrease our counter. That is slightly nasty. <laughs> The trigger is the percentage of the maximum state table size, the percentage of the maximum state table size used up by half open TCP connections. Right now, the high water mark when we enter SUN flood mode is half of the state table is used up by half open TCP connections, and we leave SUN flood mode when it's down to a quarter. These values will probably need to be changed determined. We'll learn over time. This is the initial, <coughs> initial guess. We'll learn this. Which also means initially these values will need to be buttons, tunables. If we later find out that there's a one-size-fits-all set of values, they will go away. If not, they stay. When PF is, is in SYN flood mode, detected a SYN flood, we steal the, each and every SYN very early in PF test, basically right after making sure that the packet is actually long enough to contain an IP and a TCP header. We are not even checking our rule set. We will answer each and every SYN we get with a SYN cookie SYN egg, without consulting the rule set, without consulting the state table. Obviously, for performance reasons, because the rule set evaluation is one of the most expensive operations in PF, unfortunately. And there's very, pretty much no way around it. When we actually do receive the first act from the client, as in this was alleged connection attempt, we of course have to verify the SYN cookie first. If, if it doesn't match, we just drop the packet. We then have to consult the rule set because we want, actually want to know whether we want to take this connection or not. We have to do the three-way handshake with the destination host. And fortunately, most of that code is already there because of PF zone proxy. And we have to set up the sequence number modulator because obviously when we reply to the initial sin, we choose the ISN and the destination host chose another. So we have to rewrite the sequence numbers. And the sequence number modulator is already there as well, also because of some proxy. The implementation is kind of sneaky, actually. I just reconstruct the initial SYN from the information I got. Like I rebuild an ember of containing the SYN and shove that into, into PF test. Our initial sequence number is in that first egg. We just have to deduct one, because he's egging our SYN. MSS, Windows scale, and SAC are encoded. So it's not even secret, but we don't need that here anymore. And we don't support any other TCP option. But really, these days, in practice, that is completely irrelevant, because no other TCP options are in regular use. PF test, working on that reconstructed SYN will do the rule set evaluation for us if, if we actually pass that, which I'll assume here. If we actually pass, it will create state for us. And right after, we will have to find that state, or we have to find that state, and tweak it a little bit because we will never see the SYN egg. And then we call into the SYN proxy code, which is not as easy as it sounds, to do the three-way handshake with a backend host. The destination host, well, we need to tweak the state further as the three-way handshake with the destination host progresses because we cannot set up the sequence number modulator before we know which initial sequence number the backend host chose. And from this point on, it's all the existing SUN proxy code. However, there's a proxy problem.
we need the client's first act to send it to the server. And as I mentioned, it might contain payload, even though that's very uncommon. As we send the SYN to the backend host, we have to wait for his SYN act before we cannot send anything because we don't know his initial sequence number. So what do we do? Store the first egg? Hmm. There we have resource allocation again. What we try to avoid. Since this only affects sledged connections, this would be kind of OK. But the trick we use is a different one. We just egg the initial sin again, which makes the client resend that egg. Problem solved without resource allocation. However, there's a problem with that scheme, and all SYN proxy, SYN cache, uh, cache not, but all SYN proxy alike schemes share that problem. A TCP stack will send back an RST if the port is closed, the listening socket's backlog is full, stuff like that. That means the connection never becomes established. However, when we unconditionally egg each and every SYN we receive, there won't be that RST, or it comes later, after the three-way handshake. From the client's point of view, that means the connection has been established. And there's one noteworthy case where that does make a difference, and that is round-robin DNS. Um, if you visit a web page that uses round-robin DNS, and the first host does not accept the connection, it'll go on to the next IP address. If it accepts the connection and drops it, it'll show an error message. So that is the one case. However, round-robin DNS isn't all that common. There is no way around that problem with all these SYN proxy-like schemes. And really, if we're only doing this under attack, this is a smaller problem. So acceptable in my point of view. When PF is in SYN flood mode, it's actually quite fascinating. If you nmap map any host behind a PF host in SYN flood mode, or even an entire network, each and every port will be open according to NMAP. We cannot see the attacker's IP address in the state table because we don't allocate anything in the state table. But oh well, it's moved anyway, so we don't care. And unfollowed up on SYNs will not show up in PFLOW export, like NetFlow. So it doesn't show up in your accounting. It does, might not show up in your fancy attack detection schemes. That's something to keep in mind, but almost certainly not a problem in practice. Is there any chance that it could be efficiently predicted? Probably. Yeah. Yeah, 24 hours a day. I don't think this is, is a real problem. If it turns out that, that it is, that should be relatively straightforward to add. Um, status. As of last week, I have all of this working. Um, we had a little hackathon in South Germany, um, quite remote, a really nice place, and I got it to work there. This work stated, started in Prague in the Czech Republic in, when was that, October, September? Late last year. Actually, a little bit earlier than that. Um, the vast majority of the bug fixing has been done on Bob's College in Edmonton in Canada. And uh, as I mentioned last week in Starnberg, I finally got this to work in Bavaria. So right now, the high and the low watermark are not adjustable. That will have to be changed before I can commit this. As I mentioned, we need those to be tunables for now because we don't know what the right values are going to be yet. As of last week, they at least do follow state table limit changes. They did not initially. Um, we do want, or we do need for now, a button to enable and disable some flood mode because, well, it's new and it might misbehave, and I want to give you at least a chance to disable it. Actually, I want to ship it disabled initially. Um, we'll learn over time. We might learn that the auto mode where it detects sun floods and only then enables sun cookies is so good that we don't need a button. We'll find out. I don't know. I think we'll stick with the button to turn it on and off. And the syntax, of course, is super easy. Set sun flood mode on, off, or auto. 
there is a tiny bug in the half open, the half open connections tracking. It is close enough that it does not miss trigger, but well, it needs to be fixed. And generally, polishing, man page, status output. I just ran out of time in Stammer, but that is not all that much of work left. In the future, the SynFlat mode is now tailored to protect the PF host. But can't we perhaps abuse or reuse that? to, to um, protect the backend host as well that basically needs a per backend host detection mechanism. Is that feasible? I think it kind of is. We'll find out, but that's well, future work. Um, the idea basically is to add your source nodes that we use to track how many connections a certain source address has to our backend machines to impose limits. We might be able to abuse those to track um, these counters per backend host. Might also work per rule. Future work, we'll find out. Conclusions. The TCP stacks largely have gotten those countermeasures. Stateful firewalls, as far as I'm aware, not a single one. I asked around before, apparently not. So they all rely on generic state table exhaustion countermeasures or they just don't care. With SYN cookies and actually detecting these situations and the existing SYN proxy code, we achieve quite impressive results because under a SYN flood, the, the box basically doesn't care. There's no, no diversity performance impact. The state table stays as small as it's supposed to be. No ledger traffic is affected. Exactly what we want. The attack is filtered out, ledger traffic not affected. The drawbacks I mentioned are small enough that I find them very acceptable in an attack situation. This entire thing is a, is a wonderful example on how new things happen in OpenBSD because that's not been me in my little dark corner. It's been a team effort. This all started with a discussion in Prague with around 10 developers on the whiteboard. No computer, no beer. The beer came later. Claudio was actually the one who was last hit by a large sun flood attack and had problems. I think it was also his idea to investigate sun cookies again. Bob provided the couch strings and ears to listen to my ramblings. And the design and implementation is entirely joint work with uh, Sasha. Um, to also organize the break hackathon. He did the entire half open connection accounting, and uh, we spent enormous amounts of time discussing this scheme until we figured out how this is supposed to work. Questions? <laughs> Technical questions. <laughs> Where's the connection? Uh, so from all the hosts, so you have a, 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 is the SYN protection also, like, as far as for, like, you set up PF on a, your hosts, but there's a bunch of VMs, they're doing different things, different um, Sure, I mean, the only, the only point that's relevant is that the, the box running PF is in the, in, the, in the data path. Whether that's VMs on the same host or different boxes or a slip line in between, doesn't matter. No more questions? Yes. How much of a performance impact is SynProxy going to create, uh, especially since it's only kicking in when we're getting attacked? Do you mean this mode or the old SynProxy? This mode. A lot less than a SYN <laughs> that, that is the most relevant answer, but actually this is so cheap that the performance impact is close to zero.
What do you mean? The, how does it change the way you consult your rule sex? It's changing the order of some of the operations, right? One goes from the type to the next. It basically just delays the rule set evaluation until we know that the client really wants to talk to us, as in finish the three-way handshake. And as I mentioned, the consequence is that we seem to accept everything and all ports seem to be open and might drop later and that round robin DNS thing. But that really is the only drawback. I know that this, that's actually common because I've seen talks exactly. where people are just scanning the entire internet and they, some hosts just respond to every single port. They yeah. think it's a mitigation effort against scanning, but it's actually probably a mitigation against scanning. Yeah. That's always on. That's true. It looks interesting. True, of course. You can pull your net flow from other devices if you have. Yeah. That's why I think it's not all that critical for these to actually show up in the net flow export. I mean, the net flow export is typically used for, for three different, like, there are three different very, very common use cases, and two of them are kind of the same. Um, the, the government mandated uh, data, what's the English term? Data retention, thank you. Um, the government mandated data retention laws, that means you have to store basically NetFlow information. Uh, actually, the laws are fascinating. They basically describe the data fields in NetFlow. So that's what you have to store. Um, at the same time, that is interesting for network operators to analyze what's going on. And it is very often used for accounting purposes. So for accounting purposes, we don't care about blocks at all. And well, data retention and your own analysis, whether the blocks are interesting or not, they typically aren't all that much. With the amount of background noise on the internet today, seriously. Time for beer then. <coughs> Actually, it's just, just lunch, not beer, but. <laughs> Thank you. And you didn't run out. <laughs>